Hello, my name is Dana Twombly, and I'm presenting a case study that focuses on the treatment of atrial fibrillation in the elderly patient. Rita presents to the office today with a large bruise covering her entire shin. Rita is an 80-year-old woman who reports two days ago bumping into a chair in her kitchen. She describes a large bruise developing immediately after the event and thought it should be checked out. Rita reports no other injuries or falls and expresses feeling otherwise generally well and healthy at this visit. Her past medical history includes hypertension diagnosed at age 50, atrial fibrillation diagnosed at age 65, and osteoarthritis. She had an admission for atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular rate at age 65, underwent successful cardioversion to sinus rhythm, but had recurrence of AFib two months following the procedure. At this time, the patient was started on metoprolol for rate control with good effect. Her family history includes her mother, who had hypertension, who is now deceased, her father, who had hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and MI, who deceased from that MI. Social history includes that she lives alone in her apartment in Portland. Her husband passed away 11 years ago from Parkinson's disease. She has never had children. She currently has a nine-year-old poodle who she takes on frequent walks around the neighborhood. The patient is a never smoker, drinks one glass of wine every other day or so. Medications include metoprolol, 25 milligrams BID, and warfarin per her INRs. She has allergies to sulfa and iodine drugs. The patient denies fatigue, fever, chills, and recent weight loss, denies dizziness, lightheadedness, headaches, runny nose, earaches, trouble swallowing, nausea, and vomiting, has no history of murmur, chest pain, no shortness of breath with exertion or swelling of the lower extremities. Home BP measurements are 1 teens to 120s over 70s to 80s per patient report, denies Difficulty breathing at rest, cough, wheezing, hemoptysis, asthma, COPD, denies heartburn, difficulty swallowing, jaundice, change in stools, abdominal pain, urinary frequency, painful urination and incontinence, denies swelling of the joints, reports occasional pain in her wrists and fingers from arthritis, no issues with balance or ambulation, reports large bruise on the left shin that is starting to improve, denies depression, anxiety, feeling safe at home, no suicidal ideation. In the office today for a physical exam, her exam includes the following. Patient is alert and oriented times four with no focal deficits, equal grip strength bilaterally, dorsiflexion and extension equal and strong, cranial nerves two through 12 grossly intact, no numbness or tingling noted in the lower extremities, People, pupils are equal round reactive to light and accommodation, rhythm, is regularly irregular in AFib to auscultation, S1 to S2 present in four valvular areas, no rubs, murmurs, or gallops, two plus radial pulses, extremities pink, warm, and dry with no edema, no JVD noted in seated position, respiratory patient anterior and posterior lung fields cleared auscultation bilaterally, symmetric chest expansion, no increased work of breathing, joint deformities noted in fingers, no current pain and full range of motion noted in hands, fingers, wrists, shoulders, hips, knees, slight kyphosis noted on spine. Skin is warm, dry, color normal for ethnicity. Large bruise is noted, encompassing the majority of her left shin. Bruise is blue and yellowing at the edges. Bruise soft and slightly tender. Labs are as follows, H&H &H 11 and 33, INR 2.4 platelets 248, white blood cells 6.1, creatinine 0.89, and BUN 10. So first I'm going to discuss some pathophysiology concerning atrial fibrillation. Um, it is the most common sustained cardiac arrhythmia um, and it primarily adver adversely affects cardiac hemodynamics due to a loss of atrial contraction and thus that atrial kick and additionally due to the rapid and irregularity of the ventricular rate. And this tends to cause the symptoms of shortness of breath. Um, it can also cause significant symptoms in these two thirds of patients. 
and 1.5 to 2 times an increase in mortality is typically seen, as well as a significant increase in the risk of stroke. Hypertensive valvular and ischemic, as well as other structural heart disease, underlie most cases of persistent and permanent AFib. Um, and lone AFib accounts for approximately 15% of AFib cases. The episodes of AFib are classified. Paroxysmal is whether they initiate and stop spontaneously, usually within seven days, or persistent if the arrhythmia continues requiring electrical or pharmacological cardioversion for termination. Um, AFib that cannot be converted by cardioversion and that occurs for greater than one year either where cardioversion is not indicated or has not been attempted, is described as permanent AFib. There are many ways to pharmacologically manage AFib, um, and there's still little consensus regarding treatment strategy in regard to using either strategies that target the arrhythmia conversion or those that seek to control the ventricular rate. So we're talking rate versus rhythm control. Um, in rate control strategies, the arrhythmia is going to continue, um, but symptomatic improvement, improvement is achieved due to that slower ventricular rate. Um, but the atria do continue to fibrillate, and thus the risk of thromboembolism continues. And this is why these patients with rate control drugs um, need to have anticoagulation to prevent stroke. Um, rhythm control aims to restore the patient to a sinus rhythm and thus synchronize um, atrioventricular contraction, which then eliminates the symptoms of AFib by having it disappear. Um, Yet, a lot of these drugs for rhythm control have a propensity um, to cause serious proarrhythmia. Um, they tend to be a little more difficult to manage than rate control drugs and often have higher costs. Um, data suggests that both rate and rhythm control are adequate approaches for AFib with comparable rates of mortality and stroke. Um, up to date, though, suggests a rate control strategy in most relatively asymptomatic patients that are greater than 65 years in age um, and reserve rhythm control strategies for symptomatic patients who have poor symptom relief with rate control. Um, this theory is predominantly due to those proarrhythmic responses to some of those um, rhythm control medications. Rate control strategies also as I said, um, have a simpler medication regimen and a lower cost, but due to the further risk of embolization, there is that need for anticoagulation, and this can be assessed based on the CHADS2 um, score, and you can have this score done for patients who have non-valvular AFib or valvular Some rate control medications include beta blockers such as metoprolol, calcium channel blockers such as um, diltiazem and digoxin, but digoxin is typically reserved for um, heart failure patients with a low ejection fraction um, that don't tolerate beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. Some rhythm control options are sodium channel blockers um, and potassium channel blockers. You'll see amiodarone, sodalol. Um, as far as anticoagulation therapy that's required in um, patients that can tolerate anticoagulation that we'll discuss further, um, it lowers the risk of clinical embolization in all patients with AFib. Um, but, of course, its use is associated with an increased risk of bleeding. Um, oftentimes, the benefit outweighs the risk, and oral anticoagulation therapy is recommended for all but the lowest embolization risk patients with AFib. Um, all, study, all studies that I've read have concluded that the benefit does significantly exceed the risk for almost all AFib patients with a CHAD score greater than 2 which we will go over 
in a future slide. Um, some of anticoagulation op options that are out there are warfarin and then a lot of direct acting oral anticoagulants such as apixaban, rivaroxaban, and then there's antiplatelet medications such as aspirin and Plavix. This is an algorithm um, depicting the CHAD score um, to determine whether your patient with atrial fibrillation should be anticoagulated. Um, if we think of Rita, she is an 80-year-old woman with permanent AFib and has non-valvular associated AFib. Um, if you go down on the chart, she, it asks, are they less than 65 years? No, she's 80. Um, and then you assess her risk of stroke using the CHAD score. Um, I did this in a further slide, um, and her score was 4. So if you follow down, her score was greater than one. She needs long-term anticoagulation. Um, furthermore, she also had a has blood score performed, which she scored very low on. Um, this score takes into account other comorbidities that would put you at a higher risk of bleeding that you might not want to then have your person on long-term anticoagulation. Um, uh, this chart and algorithm furthermore says that maybe she could be put on a new oral anticoagulant, um, a DOAC, which we'll talk about further as well. So I'm going to spend a little time focusing on warfarin as one of her medications. Um, warfarin inhibits vitamin K dependent synthesis, which blocks formation of clotting factors um, 2, 7, 9, and 10. And we know warfarin is primarily used to decrease an event of thrombus in a lot of different situations, as well as prophylactic treatment. Um, one thing about warfarin is that dosing can be quite difficult um, and requires monitoring through INR levels to optimize therapeutic effects um, to furthermore avoid bleeding or coagulation. Um, INR levels can fluctuate greatly depending on levels of vitamin K in the diet, so diets high in vitamin K need to be consistent. Um, sudden increases in these vitamin K-rich foods, typically leafy greens and such, could lower one's INR and put them at risk for a thrombosis, so you want to make sure that that is explained well to your patient. Um, so since warfarin poses such a significant risk of ble bleeding, um, there are benefits and risks that need to be considered with every patient. So there's a commonly used score that I mentioned earlier, the has bled score, um, which includes predictors of warfarin-related bleeding, such as uncontrolled high blood pressure, abnormal kidney function, a previous stroke, known previous bleeding conditions, previous labile INRs, when on anticoagulation, elderly is defined by the age of over than 65, over 65, and drugs associated with bleeding or alcohol misuse. So you could potentially have a patient that has a higher risk of bleeding than benefit, um, stroke prevention benefit. So that patient might not want to be on warfarin. Um, Warfarin is contraindicated in people with acting, active bleeding conditions, such as GI bleeds, or disease states which promote a risk of bleeding, um, such as low platelets, severe liver disease, like I mentioned, uncontrolled hypertension, or a future surgery. Additionally, uh, warfarin should not be given to individuals with heparin-induced thrombocytopenia or HIT until those platelets levels have normalized. Um, it should also be avoided in patients with protein C or S deficiency because this can increase the risk of de developing that scary but rare um, skin necrosis adverse reaction. So we really want to be aware if they have that deficiency. Um, for AFib, the target INR is 2.5 with a range from 2 to 3 typically, and this is non-valvular AFib. INRs should be checked more frequently on initiation of the medication, and then every one to four weeks, depending on the patient's consistency with INRs and the provider. Um, duration of therapy is variable depending on the indication, so therapy can range from three months um, 
if it's indicated for just a bioprosthetic valve, DBT or P, or maybe even post MI indications, and it can have a duration um, of a lifetime for a lot of AFib patients. As far as dosing and duration, it takes approximately six days for warfarin to exert its full efficacy, even though you won't see changes in INR for at least 24 to 36 hours and up to 72 hours. So when you give a patient a dose of warfarin, you shouldn't expect to see that reflected in the INR immediately, which can be challenging as far as dosing, how frequently they go to have their INR drawn, can um, be a little annoying for the patient, these draws. So this is all something to consider. Um, you won't achieve a therapeutic INR after starting warfarin until at least five to six days. So we know that there's a lot of alternatives to warfarin right now. Um, these DOAC medications, these direct acting oral anticoagulants, we have a class known as factor um, 10A inhibitors, such as apixaban, rivaroxaban, and then there's also direct thrombin inhibitors, such as um, DABA, Get tran. Um, research is actually suggesting that there's a lower incidence of cerebral hemorrhage in these um, DOACs compared to warfarin. Um, additionally, you know, these medications don't require diet restrictions, the lab draws that are required with warfarin, but there's less research. Um, a not as accessible antidote for um, someone who might come in with bleeding, severe bleeding, because with warfarin, we could give them vitamin K. Um, and additionally, the cost is a lot higher with these DOC medications. Um, I went on GoodRx, and for 30 pills of warfarin, 5 milligram tablets, the price can be as low as $4.97, whereas 30 pills of Apixaban, 5 milligram tablets, the same amount, um, is $232. So you can see quite a discrepancy in price, which is significant for a lot of patients. So to finally return back to Rita, um, we know she's an 80-year-old woman with permanent atrial fibrillation. Um, she has been taking an appropriate medication for rate control treatment. We know that beta blockers are an appropriate treatment. Um, her heart rate and blood pressure seem to be consistently within normal range. Um, she's complete, completely asymptomatic of her atrial fibrillation. Therefore, metoprolol seems to be adequately controlling this. Um, as described earlier, both her age and permanency of her AFib make rate control an appropriate strategy over rhythm control. Um, she did receive a cardioversion at one point that was unsuccessful, and at that time they determined to just start her on a rate control strategy. Um, I did conduct her CHADS-2 score, um, and she did score a 4. Two points were for her age over 75, one point for hypertension, and one point for her female gender. Um, it, her has blood bleeding risk score ended up um, having only one risk factor, which was her age greater than 65. So. Therefore, her bleeding risk score is 1 in 100, where her ischemic stroke risk for her CHADS2 is 4.8 in 100. Therefore, we can um, see that there's a benefit overweighing risk in concern with anticoagulation in this patient. Um, she doesn't routinely have falls um, or any accidents other than bumping into this chair. Um, her living situation is accessible and doesn't pose a large hazard in relation to anticoagulation. Um, she is adherent to her INR draws. They come back consistent. Um, so this medication, in my opinion, is a good anticoagulant for her and a good treatment plan. Um, her INR draws have been within the range of two to three almost every time. Um, and after discussion with Rita several years ago, the cheaper cost of warfarin was the main reason she didn't want to switch to a DO, DOAC agent. Um, so she's currently happy staying on warfarin. And at this point, we probably wouldn't switch in an 80-year-old patient who has been so consistent on warfarin. Um, as far as some education and teaching plan for this patient, it's important to reiterate 
to Rita the importance of a consistent diet on this medication, um, taking it at the same time every day, um, and that several OTC medications can have an adverse reaction to be aware of. We know that warfarin should not be taken with NSAIDs because we with these, we have a higher cardiac mortality rate, um, as well as a higher rate of bleeding, GI bleeding. Um, there are also some herb, herbal products that you want to tell her to um, bring up if she wanted to start anything at the appointment. An example being um, garlic supplements. These can increase the blood thinning effect of warfarin. Um, there's also herbal products that can decrease the effect um, and increase the risk of clotting, such as St. John's wort and ginseng. So just um, bringing those up. Um, she additionally reports that she only has one glass of wine every other day, but I would explain to the patient that while on warfarin, alcohol should not be used in excess because it can also cause excessive bleeding. Um, and it's also important to reiterate safety concerns. Um, if she were to develop bleeding, including a GI bleed, if she were to develop bloody stool or vomit, um, that she should immediately come in um, to be evaluated, um, it, as well as um, if she were to have any accident or fall, which she did. She made an appointment after this large bruise that she wanted to have looked at. So for the most part, Rita's doing great, and I agree with her teaching plan and treatment plan. Um, so that concludes this case study. My references are listed below. Um, thank you very much.